Revelation. We're going to look at a couple of verses from chapter 15, and today we're going to get into Revelation 16. And we want to get to the near the end of it, because then today we get to Armageddon. We've had 666, we've had Beast, now we get Armageddon. Those are the, those are the three big things that people love in the book of Revelation. They want to talk about the Beast, they want to talk about the Mark of the Beast, 666, and they want to talk about Armageddon. The interesting thing is we're going to see today, Armageddon's a real pooper. It's not what everybody thinks. Everybody thinks Armageddon, we're going to blow the world up, and everything's going to go sky high and everything else, and this is going to be a real downer. Uh, as we're going to see for all of these people, is uh, there really isn't much to Armageddon uh, because uh, Armageddon's already happened, and uh, so it's, it's going to be a real interesting thing. And if you just read the text, what everybody wants to throw out there for Armageddon it is not anything like what we have in the Book of Revelation at all. So that'll that'll kind of be the end of it here. And I kind of apologize. Normally we're in the Bible study room, the ABC room, we've got kind of a big board, but we need to put something on the board, I think, to help people visualize what's going on here in the book of Revelation. So we're going to have to kind of um, put on some glasses or binocs or use some or something to kind of see on the board, so it'll have to be small, but we'll try to we'll try to make it work here in a second. So let's jump in here to the text in a moment after we have a word of prayer, as everybody's been talking about Texas and Everybody's suffering and everything there. We'll kind of keep all those people here uh, in our prayers here as well today uh, with all the winter weather and all the suffering they've been going through down there. And we'll keep our country and uh, everything else here in our prayers as well. So let's go ahead here and we'll open up with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, this is the day you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We give you thanks for the opportunity here to, to gather on it. On a nice uh, sunny day as we give thanks to God that hopefully this week we'll see some warmer weather and temperatures. I especially pray that you would be with uh, the people down in Texas that they've been suffering over the last 10 days with uh, lack of ability to have uh, energy, um, food, clean water. I continue to bless them as they rebuild their infrastructure and as hopefully people begin to get back to their uh, daily routines and uh, rebuild their own lives. Uh, may they, uh, with all of us here today, see these things as an opportunity to know that life is very fragile, uh, that we need to repent, and believe the good news that's found in the victory that's in Christ alone. Uh, be with our country, with its leadership, O oh Lord, as we continue to deal with all the various issues that are facing us. Uh, may your Holy Spirit lead and guide us this day, for into your hands we commend ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's take a look here. As I said, we're going to look at a couple of verses from chapter 15. There's a seminary in here. Dan kind of covered a few things. And then we're going to jump right into 16. But let's look here at uh, chapter 15, verse 1. And then we're going to read the last 5 through 8 of uh, chapter 15. But in chapter 15 last week, John said, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels, seven plagues, which are the last. So this is it. I mean, we're, we're heading now towards the end of time here. Final judgment. These are the last. For with them, the wrath of God is finished. It's done. It's over. And here, here's what I want to do, putting this, this, this on the board, to get a picture. We had Dr. Piazza kind of was here last week asking some questions. You know, we keep flashing back and forth here and everything else. I'm trying to get a picture of what's happening. But let's... Let's kind of look here. Here's the cross. And I know, like I said, this is going to be a little bit difficult. You just don't have much of a board to deal with here. We've got the cross. We've got the empty tomb. We've got our Lord's ascension into heaven. So let's put that kind of on the timeline right here. John's writing somewhere down the road here, somewhere between 60 and 90 AD. He's writing right here. This is the great tribulation. The church is suffering. Is the church, though, always suffering? Yeah, it's always the church militant. Because what's, what's in opposition? The devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. So John is writing, and he's looking at the people who are suffering. We've got a lot of people who are being martyred for the faith. Remember, where are the souls of the martyrs? They're underneath the altar. What are they crying out from the Psalms? How long? How long is this all going to go on? How long is the church going to suffer? I thought we're victorious. Yes, we're victorious in Christ, but in our lives, are we always victorious? No. In Christ, we are. And as we look to eternity, we are. But 
the opposition is still there in this lifetime. So, you know, John's here, and what is he doing? Well, let's look to when the Lord comes again on Judgment Day. Right here, we'll put kind of, he comes in the power, you know, in the clouds with, with great glory. We look here, and we pick up here. The Lord's going to come and judge again. Now, to give us a picture of Judgment Day, where does John go? He always goes back to here. The Old Testament. So we come here and we circle back over to here. And what do we circle back to? All the images in time, in history, of the Lord judging the world. And what do we get? We get the flood. What do we get? We get Sodom and Gomorrah, as we saw. So we've got Sodom and Gomorrah, which came after that. What else What else are we getting? <coughs> For captivity, you know, down into Egypt. And then also later in the, all the... Oh, going to Babylon and everything else. So then we've got, you know, flowing. So we've got the flood. We've got Sodom and Gomorrah. We've got what comes next, the captivity in Egypt, which is right there. And then to get the people out of the Exodus, what does the Lord say? The plagues. The plagues. And what do, we, what do we got here? These are the seven angels with the seven plagues. plagues. So we're kind of we're kind of going back. Here's the pictures of what judgment has always looked like, and then and what it's going to be in the end. So we've got so we've got the plagues, then we've got the captivity, all right, and everything else heading out into Babylon, coming back. We've got then Daniel, we've got Ezekiel, we've got all these pictures because Daniel gives us the pictures of everything that's going to happen of God's judgment in time and history, leading all the way up. Because we've got all the great empires. Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, then, and then finally the Romans coming, and all the opposition to the church. So he comes back here, and he picks it all up, and he comes back into here and says, you know, in time, God is going to judge. In time. But it's not always a full judgment, because remember, it was a third, it was a fourth, and everything else, and there's still going to be opposition. But then again, where we're at here, where do we look? To the end of time. There is, look at it. The saints are there. They've made it. They've washed their robes. They made the white and the blood of the Lamb. But the question is, you're going to let the bad guys get away with it. Well, no, I haven't. Let's go back and review the Old Testament. Look at what I've always done through here. Look at what I'm going to be doing right now in time. That brings us, now we're getting closer here. Okay, we're still struggling though. Oh, look. The Lord's going to come again. In the meantime, people in time will be judged. But some people are going to, quote, get away with it from our perspective. But there's a judgment in time. What does that judgment look like? Well, what has God always done? And back we go again. Here's the picture. Back to the Old Testament. Then it brings us here. Now we're here. We're getting closer. Oh, same question. How long are you going to let this go, Lord? Well, again, I'm coming again. The saints have made it. All right. There's, there's going to be vindication. The Lord's on his throne. He's totally in charge. Final judgment is coming. Look at what I've always done. Boom, we go back again. Then we finally get to the point where now we're going to beat the last judgment. And it's kind of we're moving forward, covering the same ground going here of the church age, which is the thousand years in the book of Revelation. And I know this is kind of small, but hopefully it kind of gives you a visual here. Of, of, of kind of what we're doing that kind of you know answers a little bit of Dr. Piazza's statement you know and his question of kind of it just seems like we're bouncing around and everything else and where are we we're, we're always kind of continuing to cover the same ground but we're looking at it from different angles different viewpoints and remembering how in the past God was always faithful preserving the remnant getting his saints to the finish line and providing judgment in time. But there's going to be finally a time when it's the end and the Lord brings final judgment, which is now where we're heading here in the book of Revelation. This is, this is going to be it. This is the last place. This is going to take us back to Egypt again. We're going to, we're going to go through here in chapter 16. The wrath of God now is finally going to be full, complete, and it's going to be finished. So let's go here to verse 5, and then we'll read to the end of 15, because that helps us roll right into 16 today, which is our topic today. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. Remember, the tent of witness was out there in the wilderness. 
And it's kind of taking us back to Egypt. God provided. God's presence was there as the people wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. The purpose of that was to lead them to repentance before they entered into the promised land. The wilderness that we're in right now, which is the church. Remember, you go back and think uh, Dan had that like a month ago where you know we had the church out in the wilderness. And, the, and the, that's us right now. We're in the wilderness. It's a time for what? Repentance, growth, strengthening of faith before we enter into the promised land. The promised land for us is what? Heaven, not a chunk of ground over in the Middle East. It was a chunk of ground for the, for the people of Israel in the Middle East. For us, we're, we're in the wilderness right now, heading into the promised land of heaven. But in the middle of this suffering, this tribulation, the great tribulation, who's there with us? The Lord, just as he was with the people of Israel. And it was always the spot where the Lord was found, the tent of witness. You know, the, the, they, they prayed that always around. And there, there was the visible sign, it was the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud. The Lord is with us, even in the midst of all this. And out of the sanctuary, where are all the plagues coming from? The seven angels come with the seven plagues. They're clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. They're kind of almost replicas of the picture we had of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. We go back earlier, those bowls, remember, were the prayers of the saints that were placed there. How long are you going to let this go? And then the incense was in the bowls. The prayers were going up. How long? Now those bowls have been emptied. Our prayers have gone up. The Lord has heard them. And now what did the Lord put in those, those bowls? Wrath. Wrath. The prayers now are answered. Now here comes the wrath of God. Now that is what we're going to talk about. That's hard for us moderns to understand because we don't like judgment. We don't like wrath. And we don't want to have God actually being a God of wrath and a God of judgment. I mean, that, we've kind of got rid of that today in the modern church, especially in our country. But that, there's a lot of trouble if that because then there's no justice of God. And what's God coming to save us from? He just lets the bad guys get away with it? I mean, you might as well go out and do whatever the heck it is you want. God forgives you and you go to heaven. Who cares? No, there's... There's, there's that side of God, the wrath of God. The prayers have been answered. And that's something, too. How often do we pray for judgment? We don't even want to talk about judgment, let alone pray for it. That, you know, God would come and judge the world as we confess in the creed. He's coming again to judge the living and the dead. We don't even, we don't even want to go there. But those, but those prayer, but those prayers now are being answered, and the bowls now are filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. The sanctuary was filled with smoke. It's always the presence of God. You know, as he says, smoke's up on the altar. That's why, you know, we got candles and everything else. We saw that, you know, with the, 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 the seven lampstands earlier in the book of Revelation. And the sanctuary was filled with the smoke from the glory of God. That's the presence of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. <laughs> this is now the end. And so this is the final judgment. When this is all over, then when he's coming back to judge the living and the dead, and now we enter into the promised land. So that takes us now to 16. So we've got judgment coming from heaven, coming from the presence of God. And he's going to pour out now the wrath of God from these seven bowls. Again, what is seven? Perfect. Complete. Total. This is now complete, total, perfect judgment. This is the end. Remember before, the angels were holding back the final judgment at the four winds. Remember? Because, and why? What was the reason for that? Giving what? Time for people to what? Repent. And that's even the picture. You've got to keep that in mind when you read 16. This is not chronological. So many people read Revelation 16. Well, first we're going to have this plague, then we're going to have this plague, then we're going to have this plague, then we're going to have this plague. Where are we at in time? Which plague are we at? 
let, let's be honest here. We always want to look at the cold weather right now and climate change or whatever it may be, and we want to look at this from a scientific standpoint. Ultimately, who's in charge of the weather? God. When he was doing all the climate change in Egypt, was it just greenhouse gases and everything else that was causing it? No, it was God. We, we, we want to take away the power from God as if he's not in control of the climate. God's in control of the climate. And what is he doing right now? Leading us to what? Repentance. Hopefully to repentance. Then, you know, guys, your, your life here on earth is very fragile. Even with all of our electrical power grid and everything else, I mean, we kind of control nature to a certain extent. Now, we think, you know, the part shakes our head, no. But, I mean, we can control it a lot more than what, what the ancients could. And, and so, you know, we've been able to do a lot of things. You know, it gets 20 below zero, and, you know, most of us aren't going to die. Because we've still got heat, we've still got running water, we've got a safe place, you know, to sleep and, and to take shelter from the cold. The ancients couldn't do that. But we can. But all of a sudden now, what's God trying to tell us? Don't get too big of a head. Don't get too big of a head, people. You know, and all of a sudden, 15 million people in Texas don't have any power. And they're running out there trying to drink, you know, the snow that they bring in and everything else. Just trying to stay alive. People burning their furniture, you know, and, and everything else. I mean, some people back their car into the garage, opened up the door and turned it on and tried to heat their house that way. Some of them didn't survive, as we heard some of those stories. That's how desperate it was getting for some people. But the whole point, again, is we want to think always in terms of nature as if God's not in control. And these plagues, again, are they literal? Is God going to you know, turn off the sun? Is he going to send boils? And everybody's going to get boils, as we're going to read here in a moment. Is, is, is every drop of water on planet Earth going to turn into blood? No, 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 no. What, what are these? Saul symbolic. We're going back to to uh, pictures, and again, the plagues in Egypt, were they random acts of violence on God's part? No. What were they attacking? Sin. Sin, and, and all the plagues were against what? The gods of Egypt. Their idols. Who they put their trust in. The interesting thing, so we have to understand, is God is sending these things to us. It's the same thing. It's the things that are our idols, that we want to put our trust in. Well, I can control nature. You know, I've got my power grid. I've got my generator. I've got my Brita water filter. You know, I've got, I've got everything that I need. I'm fine. i got my wood-burning stove, and i got a, I got a pile of wood out back. Somebody was reading a story last night. Put him in the bed. Guy said I ran out of wood, even. And nowhere to go to even get some wood. So what do you do? You start burning everything you can find in your house. Burn the books, burn everything. You know, I had a week to ten days supply of wood, and I burned through that in a few days. So now i got to burn everything to stay alive. See, we think we've kind of got everything all planned out. We, we've got our survival gear. I've got my rations in the basement. I've got everything that I need. I can sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. Take it easy, you know, with the parable of the rich fool. I, yeah, I, I've got it all control. I'll build bigger barns. I'll put a generator in. And I got everything. I'm set. And what does God come and do? Just rip it all out from under us. And so again, you don't read Revelation. Oh, these are literal plagues. I'm looking for lightning to come down. and I'm looking for hailstones that are 100 pounds as we're going to get here. And I'm going to get 100 pound hailstones coming out of the sky. Boulders and everything else. No, they're getting their pictures. Of what God was doing. This is how God judged the idols of the Egyptians in the Old Testament. He'll do the same thing right now. Purpose. To get even with you? I hate them. Those people that are crazy Texans. Wham! I'm going to show them who's boss. No, he loves us enough to want us to come to repentance. Correct. Which is what we had in our readings yeah. for Ash Wednesday. Yeah. He's merciful, gracious, slow to anger abounding in steadfast love and desires that his people would come to repentance and faith and trust in the God who actually made everything and who died for you and loves you. And to see that all of your idols and the things that you believe in are worth less. All the things that the people in Texas thought were going to get them through, none of them were worth anything. But they 
when the chips were down. We also read how the people opened up their business. Correct. And then the love of God, and that's God working through all that. You know, the furniture owner, you know, the, the, the people, the, the delivery lady from Amazon or whatever it was, got caught in the store and couldn't get... Dave, she was with, with the, You know, you read all the stories. Again, God's love in the midst of all that. Just like you had God's love in the midst of the plagues even in Egypt. Because there's that line there, when the people left Israel, we kind of forget that. Who also came with them? A bunch of Egyptians. Bingo. We kind of we kind of forget that one. And the Egyptians gave them things to take with them. Correct. Yep. And a bunch of Egyptians came to faith. Why? Because they saw their gods are worthless, and they also had the friendly actions of some of the Hebrews. The same thing. God works. It's amazing. God works the same way. It's his MO in all times, in all places. And that's the book of Revelation where we're getting this big picture view. See, it's the end of the Bible. John knows I'm, I'm wrapping this baby up. This is it. I'm the last man standing. There's no more scripture. I'm the last disciple left. This is it. We're closing it up. And now God in this vision is tying up all the loose ends. But we want to look at it from current events. It's not current events in geopolitical places and people and time. It's how God works and has always worked in time, in history. And we're taking a grand tour of the past here in the, in the book of Revelation. Yes, Mel? Well, there's another example of it. Uh, Patrick kind of and I talked about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, they sent power trucks and all kinds all over the United States and sent it to that hurricane relief. And it's been going on forever and ever. It's not just... Right, and all of those people are pictures of the help that only God can bring. That's right. And that's where Martin Luther would say, you look for Jesus. Where do you look for Jesus? Jesus is coming to help in the midst of the people that he sends to help. To show us that we're not independent free agents and we can do it on our own. We're always dependent. Most importantly on God. But even in life we can be dependent on our, on our fellow neighbors who come and they're now Christ to us. In the midst of all this. Showing us our only hope is for help to come outside of us. And that's, that's the purpose of all this. And that's where the church and God's people are called to help. Down there. But, you know, as that, we just want to have that operating in the background as we start to read this. So that we're not looking, okay, when is, when is the 100-pound hailstones coming? When is the Atlantic Ocean going to become, you know, two miles deep worth of blood and everything else? No. I would be surprised when that happens. <laughs> but but it's, not, it's not a literal thing. You know, from the standpoint, yes, God turned the Nile into blood. No, because God promised harvest and seed time until the Right, end. after the flood. Never again will I flood the earth. Exactly. Yeah, they're always going to be hot and cold. Yeah. The seasons are always going to remain after the flood. Yeah. He says that. Always be night and day, summer, winter, yeah. seed time and harvest. It's yeah. always going to be there. Because who's ultimately in control? God. God's in control. All right, so let's jump into the text. Chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple. This is heaven now. Telling the seven angels, go and pour out on earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Now, this is very interesting. When we hear the word go, what do we think of at the end of the Gospel of Matthew? Go and make disciples of all nations. What do we call that? The Great Commission. Commission. The Great Commission to go and spread the Gospel. Now we've got the kind of the opposite of the Great Commission. Now go and take the judgment of God to those who did not listen to the Great Commission and repent. Because as we get to every single one of these plagues now that are coming, God sent all these things. He's behind the severe pole. You know, we can see here, and I, you know, I was, I was fascinated. What causes the polar vortex? This, that, the other thing, you know. You sit on there and get the Weather Channel, and I read this long, ten-page lengthy article on what all happens in the polar vortex and everything, and how it sat in Texas and everything else. And yeah, we got the science behind it, but who's the god of science behind it all? God. We're never going to get that. You know, 
know from the media, CNN's not going to give it to you, Fox News isn't going to give it to you, the Weather Channel isn't going to give it to you. But, but who's behind the polar vortex? Who sent it? God has to be. Otherwise, he's not omnipotent anymore. He's not in control. Oh, that caught him off guard. Didn't see the polar vortex coming. Shoot. <laughs> Missed that one. Wish he wouldn't have been playing golf 10 days ago. Could have stopped that before it kind of got messy down there for those poor people. Right. Next time I'll be I'll be on uh, I'll be on you know on on the job and make sure that doesn't happen. No, God God's in control of that. We got the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching them everything I have commanded you. Now go and take the judgment of God to all those who didn't listen to the Great Commission and didn't repent. Because as we get through every single one of these plagues, they had the opportunity. And they didn't repent. They hardened their heart. Who does that sound like? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Yeah, go back here. It's Pharaoh. Hard his heart, would not repent. A question, Pastor. Yep. Um, when you talk about Pharaoh hardening his heart, God said, I will harden Pharaoh. Then finally gets to the point where God finally, yeah, there's a point in time when then God says, I'm going to harden it. Yeah. And um, then that's a. <laughs> it was that so that he could continue to show. The, their God's word. He's going to take them all out. Yeah. I mean, there we get into what Luther calls the hidden mind of God. So we want to be really careful because it's hidden. He hasn't revealed that to us. You know, it, it's, it's the Old Testament says the revealed things of God are for us to know and understand. The hidden things of God are not for us to understand. Now we're starting to get into those, those hidden things which God hasn't revealed to us. So why is it there at a certain point in time? Pharaoh hardened his heart, then you get through, I can't remember which plague it is, then it says, it switches, God hardened his heart. Seven. Yeah, seven, so, you know, there it is. Um, is it ultimately then to kind of, it could be, I mean, it makes sense, but again, that's God's plan and not ours. To finally, you know, I'm going to take out the God on earth for you, God in the flesh, Pharaoh. Now take out the firstborn. The next Pharaoh, the next God in the flesh for you, God. Everything that you want to rely on in fear, love, and trust, I'm going to take away from you. Sounds like that's the deal. Again, God hasn't revealed that to us. But I think that's the whole point. I'm going to run this because the goal is to show you that God gave him a chance. But that's also to remind us, God is, God is a long-suffering God. He's giving us all chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. But then finally what happens? There's an end to those chances. God's going to take you. You'll die. Or judgment day is going to come. God is very, I mean, he keeps going over and over and over and over again. But don't take his grace for granted. And don't misuse it. And so there, there's finally that, that time when God shuts it all down. And so we've got the opposite of go and tell the good news now go and bring the judgment on those who didn't believe the good news. See, now we're getting the answer to the prayer of how long. There's, there's that justice of God. It's coming. Let's move now to verse 2. Verse 2, So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people, who bore the mark of the beast, and worshipped its image. Now remember, before, if you're going to be able to, to uh, do business and everything else, live, function in society, you got to have the mark of the beast. you got to worship the God on the earth, which was the government. And hail Caesar and all of their gods. They, the people wanted that mark so that what? They could survive here on earth. God says, the interesting thing, you want that mark? Now I'm going to send you a whole bunch of marks. I'm going to send you a whole bunch of boils. Painful skin sores. What does that remind us? The plague of the boils back there in the Old Testament. You, you, you wanted power, you wanted good things in this life. It only lasted for a little bit of time. Now you're going to be marked for eternity. It's going to be very painful. That reminds us of the story of the rich man and, and Lazarus. Lazarus had all those sores. The dogs were licking him and everything else. The rich man had everything in this life, man. He had the mark of the beast. He was living high off the hog. But for eternity, what happens? It switches. Now he's got all the sores. He's in agony. He's burning for eternity. And Lazarus has all the blessings of God. And so there's, it's, it's a, now you're going to be marked for eternity. That's not, you're going to be suffering for eternity. 
And uh, again, this is symbolic judgment. And uh, it's not going to be a pleasant judgment at all. But uh, they've got all the marks. All those who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Now let's, let's look here at uh, verse 3. As we remember from the end of verse 2, these people now prefer to be marked by Satan in this life, but now they're going to be marked with a negative life and, and a negative mark by God for eternity. Verse 3. Now the second angel pours out his bowl into the sea. And it became like the blood of a, of a corpse. And every living thing died that was in the sea. Now we're seeing universal judgment. Remember before it was a fourth, a third. We're, we're increasing numbers now. Now again, now it's every living thing. Now this is, this is the end. This is the end. We're moving to final judgment. Verse 4. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers. So we had salt water. All right, in, in, in verse 3, Dr. Randy can't go out there off the coast of San Diego now and do his deep sea fishing <laughs> that he loves to do. And he's got that next trip planned. You know, everything out there in salt water is dead. Now we're not just doing salt water. What's God going to do? Fresh water. What we drink. What we need to survive. This is going to remind us of John's gospel. I am the living water. The water in this life is dead water. Because what? It can't keep you alive forever. If you drink of me, you'll never thirst. Lady at the well goes, well, give me that, sir. I'll never have to come back here to draw any water. I, I want this water as a well that springs up for eternal life. God's taking away all the things that we trust in. We worship, as Paul says in Romans 1, we worship and serve the creation rather than the creator who is to be forever praised. Amen. We worship the creation. That's, that's where we're at in our society today. We worship the created things and the creation rather than the creator. And the interesting thing is all of our gods, especially the gods of the Egyptians, were all what created things? The water, the sun, the uh, cattle, the pharaoh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take them all out. I'm going to take them all out. So now he pours out his bowl, verse 4, into the rivers, the springs of water, and they become blood. So now I'm going to hit the fresh water. Then I get here to verse 5. What does it say? 5 and 6. This is the wow statement for us moderns. This should make you feel very uncomfortable. It should. Because we just, we just don't hear things like this. Verse 5, verse 6. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O holy one, who is, who was. For you brought these judgments. Who brings all these things? As I said earlier, that's just not Eric Allmeyer's opinion. It better not be. Because if it is, you better tell me, get off and go somewhere else. Get off the, the, the stage, get out of the pulpit, go somewhere else. It's not my opinion. This is the words of Scripture. Who brings these judgments upon the earth? Who brings the cold weather? Who brings the drought? God. He's in control of the weather. It's why somebody, somebody came into my office the other day and we were talking about the weather and everything else. And this person said, gee whiz, I wish I was a weatherman. What are they right about 20% of the time? You know, they can, they can, they can, and I said, well, we're supposed to get this as last week. We're supposed to get this big storm. And they said, well, Pastor, that's what they said two weeks ago. We're supposed to get six to ten inches. And what did we get? Half an inch. <laughs> and I wouldn't count on this. We'll be in church on Ash Wednesday. I'm not thinking, well, we had, what did we get there? Monday, Tuesday, eight inches. So, I mean, they did we were kind of close, but, you know, their, their, their whole point is, when are these people, Pat Young, she was one of them last week, so the weather people don't know anything. But, you know, that wasn't you, though, who came into my office, but she was one of them, weather people. Is. But that's all of us. We had that conversation. When I said, well, you never know, because, I mean, they say this and that, and you're never right. But who, who's ultimately in charge of the weather? God. Who brings these judgments? You're, 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 you're just. You're holy. You're the one who is and was. For you brought these judgments. Then we get to verse 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. And now you have given them blood to drink. Alright, here. Drink it. You, you've been in opposition. You've spilled the blood. You've spilled the blood of the innocents. The martyrs who are now under the altar. Now, here it is. You'll have to drink this to survive. Here it is. Then we get those words with an exclamation point at the end of verse 6. It is what they 
deserve. Holy smokes. That's a wowser right there. They're getting what they deserve. That reminds us, in the Lent season, we got the two crooks. Really, they were insurrectionists. They were terrorists on the cross. They were wanted for insurrection, murder in the city. We always think they're like petty thieves. They stole bubble gum from the five and dime, dime store in downtown Jerusalem. No, they were they were murderers. And remember that they're, they're both making fun of Jesus at the start. Then one comes to faith, and he tells the guy on the other side of the cross, hey, quit flapping your gum. Shut your mouth. He's innocent. We're getting what we deserve. That's true repentance. <clears throat> Understanding, I deserve for God to come and take me out to the woodshed and give me a good whooping for the rest of eternity. That's what I deserve from God. Not that I don't understand why God does this. This is not fair. I thought he's loving. That's the modern world. Yes. That's the modern world. And that's why we really struggle with this. God is actually coming to execute judgment? See, the person we're supposed to fear is who? We think it's the devil. But it's God. Fear God. Because let's back the truck up at the cross. When he finally tells his compatriot in crime to shut his mouth, quit making fun of Jesus, and he says, hey, we're, we're, this guy's innocent. We're getting, though, what we deserve. What does he say? What's his words before that? Don't you, anybody know? Don't you fear God? Those are some amazing words. Don't you, he's, he's saying who's there in the middle? God, don't you fear God? Don't you fear God? I think that's the question that's for us in the modern world. Even in the church, we want to get rid of hell, we want to get rid of you know, uh, judgment, we want to get rid of that Satan, we want to get rid of everything. But those words from the insurrectionist on the cross next to Jesus, don't you fear God? Because he's the one who comes to bring judgment. It's what we deserve. What, what, what do the angels say? What do the interesting thing, this, you know, this, then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, just are you, O holy one. Who is it was? You, you brought these judgments. You why? Because these people are not innocent. They've shed the blood of saints and prophets, and now you've given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. The interesting thing is, why does this make us feel uncomfortable? Because we all know that we deserve that. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's kind of a twofold thing. We know that we all deserve it, and number two, we're worried about whom? The family members and friends, maybe, who don't know. And that and that's why it does. It makes us feel very uncomfortable. This is this is what they deserve. But we all know this is what all of us deserve. And so the interesting thing though is we're going to see here in a moment these prayers now of how long are really the prayers of the saints to bring what? Judgment. To bring judgment. To punish the evildoer. How many prayers do you hear in church? Oh Lord, please punish the evildoers. Anybody hear those prayers Sunday after Sunday? No, the interesting thing though is turn to the Psalms and what do you get? And it's maybe one of the reasons why we need to be praying the Psalms a little bit more. Oh Lord, punish the evildoers. These prayers of how long, that's really kind of short uh, Cliff Notes versions of, oh Lord, when are you going to finally bring your judgment? The saints were praying for judgment on the evildoers. Yeah, that, that's, that's a hard one for us to grapple with as moderns. Because we don't believe that's fair. We don't believe it's loving. We, how can God be just and loving and punish the wrongdoers? We'll get to that here in a moment. But, you know, God is going to be just. He's not going to punish anybody who doesn't deserve it. Well, how could God be loving if he let Jesus die on the cross? Right. So he, he let, he, he's going to place, that's, that's where we're going to see the justice and the love of God meet here that we're going to get in a moment. Yeah, go ahead, Kurt. So pray, so I struggle with that because I shouldn't judge, I shouldn't say, I told God 
I mean, that's what I feel. I mean, because I'm you, afraid you he's going to bring you, judgment down on me. Correct. And the interesting thing is, we can't judge. And we can't judge specific people. Notice if you read the Old Testament and you read the Psalms, it's not, Dear Lord, please smite Joe, Biff, Freddie, and, and, and George. <laughs> and please don't wait. Do it in the next five minutes. No, it's what? Bring your judgment on those who have what? Sin, rebel, defame your people, your church, or those who have defamed your name. Your name, not specific people. That's not our place. That's not our place. You know, we don't see in Revelation, Dear Lord, wipe out Nero, Diocletian, and that real idiot Tiberius. Take him out now. No, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't get that. You know, take out this political party, wipe out, dear Lord, wipe out Washington, D.C. right now. You know, no, you don't, you don't, you don't see that. You know, what? There are some people that are afraid that. Yeah. But, but that's, 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 not, that's not what we're seeing there. Oh, Lord, vindicate your name. Those who, it's see, again, it's not about me, because we want to pray, oh Lord, these people have been mean to me. No, the affront is not against me, the affront is against God. Because even Saul, remember on the road to Damascus, the Lord comes down, Saul has been killing people, Christians, everything else. Notice, the Lord comes to Saul, and he doesn't say, Saul, why, why did you kill Stephen? Why did you stone Stephen? He was, he, was my, he was my apostle. He was my deacon. You know, why, why did you kill Stephen? No, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Me. me. There it is. We, we don't do any of the judging. I had a conversation yesterday with somebody. I ah, these Christians, man. You're, just, you're always judging. You know, you're just, such, such judging people. Where do you get off deciding what's right and wrong? I said, no, 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 wait a minute. You're the one who you just got done telling me, you don't think this is right, you don't think this is wrong. You, you were giving me all of your own personal judgments. I believe, personally, abortion is okay. A woman has a right to... You, you, you just got done judging. Now that you told me, you got done telling me, well, you, you, you can't judge. You Christians want to judge. You want to tell me what I can and can't do with my body, or if I want to smoke weed, or whatever it is. That's my own personal choice. You, you can't judge me. Well, you just got done making all these personal judgments. Now, I'll make a statement, but I'm going to tell you what. I'm not going to give you any judgment from Eric Allmeyer whatsoever. It's not personal at all. It's not what I believe. It's not what I think. It's not my thoughts on this matter. I'm going to tell you what God Almighty has to say. And then he's going to do the judging, not me. I don't judge deadly squat. I leave it to the Lord. Now that kind of scares them a little bit. Well, then I get this answer, though. But that's what you believe the judgment is from the Bible. Everybody who's a Christian has got their own personal opinion about the judgments of God. It doesn't matter. God's got his opinion. Correct. And my, the whole idea is, well, you better search the scriptures and make sure that your interpretation of the judgment of God matches what the actual judgment of God is. That's the point. You, know you better I mean? make sure you're on the side of God. And it, you know what? The plain things are the main things in scripture, and the main things are the plain things. And a lot of these things are pretty plain. And they're the main things. And it's pretty clear. And so let's let the word of God speak. And he's the one who will do the judging. And that's the difference. It's not my thoughts. It's not my opinions. It's thus says the Lord. And we go from there. Yes, I always Dave. help. I mean, I don't know if it helps people, but I always remind them that God says he's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. First and the last. And without him, we wouldn't even be here. And that's when he decides where we're going to go. It's his choice. Not he's it. That's when Moses goes and we have to start the plagues. He's supposed to go, you know, and sees God there in the burning bush. You know, you're going to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses says, well, that's great, but I was a prince in Egypt for four years. I know how they roll there, you know, in Pharaoh Hall. Uh, I actually sat in the throne room and everything. I, I, I kind of know the uh, inner workings there at Pharaoh. Uh, they got a lot of gods there. They got a lot of power. Um, 
when I say that uh, I'm supposed to let my people go, what God <coughs> am I supposed to say is telling Pharaoh? Because I'm actually speaking to God there on earth. <laughs> this is how they look at it. Uh, who am I supposed to say is supposed to let the people go? Uh, God says to Moses, you just tell them I am. I am says, let the people go. I meant. I've got all being. It's the verb to be. I've got everything, eternity, everything, all power in me. I'm it. Apart from me, there is no other. The Old Testament scriptures say, I'm it, man. You just say, the one and only says, let my people go. Because I'm God. And there's the, there's the difference. But we'll get to it here in a moment, which maybe we'll have some time. We always want to be God because that's the temptation in the wilderness. To eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The temptation there is, I will decide what is good. I will decide what is evil, not God. So I will eat, now I become God. I make the call on good and evil. I'm in control, I'm in charge. And that's, that's what these plagues, as we'll get to here in a moment and in the next week, are all about. Let's, let's look though at the next verse, verse 7. And I heard the altar saying... Now, this, do we, is, is this like watching the Chronicles of Narnia, you know, where the trees and the animals and everything talk, you know, reading C.S. Lewis's books, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, and Prince Caspian, and Voyage to Dawn Treader, all that sort of stuff. Is, is, now, do we have a talking altar in heaven? No. Who's under the altar? The saints. The saints. All those who have died prior to this and their souls are in heaven, especially the martyrs who are under the altar. I heard the altar say, now we have the angels say, your judgments are true and just. They deserve, they're getting what they deserve. Then, who chimes in and says the same thing? The angels are saying, the saints of God. Then I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Now, we can spend a lot of time with this. This is always the hard one. I'm just, I'm not going to. We, we can field a lot of questions. It answers always the question, my, my son, my daughter, my cousin, my best friend, my wife, whoever doesn't believe, how am I going to be able to survive for the rest of eternity in heaven and they're not there? The answer everybody gives is, well, we just won't know they're not there. Show me in the Bible where, where you find that chapter and verse. It's not. The interesting thing is our mind becomes what? Just like God's. And what did the saints, whose mind now is just like God, what did the saints say under the altar? True and just are your judgments. They rejected. They did not repent. I'm fine with that for the rest of eternity. That's a double wowser. We had a wow here earlier. Now we just laid down a double wowser. Because that's a hard one for me with some of my family and friends that are not believers right now that I struggle with, that I, I'm not going to have a problem with them suffering in hell. Why? Because my mind is just like the God's mind, God's mind who actually put them in hell. How true and just are your judgments? That's a hard one. That's a, that's a hard one for us this side of heaven to grapple with. You know, and, I, and I've had a lot of... It, we could spend a tremendous amount of time digging in that one. But um, we, our mind will be just like God, and God's judgments are always righteous and just. So do the saints believe there should be a judgment on those who don't believe, for those who reject? Yes? You only know Jesus, you'll become one and only know Jesus. Well, we'll we'll know the other people. I mean, because just like on the Mount of Transfiguration, yeah. it says we will be known and we will fully know. We see here's the interesting thing, you won't need a name tag. When you get into the pearly gates and Peter's there, Joe, but Peter's there doing your registration, you won't you won't, won't get here. Put this uh, Eric, put this on your name tag. Uh, you know, on your on your on your road there. Hello, my name is Eric Allmeyer. So that when I'm walking around, St. Paul says, 
Eric Allmeyer. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? And who were you and what did you do? And I, the Apostle Paul, I know about you. You know, but then Paul says, I don't know about you. And then we get into, you know, this great conversation. No, we'll, we'll know everybody just like God knows everybody. And so, will we'll, I know everybody? I mean, Peter, James, and John, they don't, hey, who are you up there? Heaven's come down to earth. That's Moses. That's Elijah. We'll, we'll walk into heaven. There's Adam. There's Joseph. There's Mary. There's Martin Luther. I mean, you know, we'll just, there's the Apostle Paul. There's Peter, James, and John. There's Elijah. We'll, we'll know them all. There's Father Abraham, Isaac. I want to have a wonderful conversation about our Old Testament reading here. That's one of the first people I want to sit down and talk to. And that is, did Isaac fight you? You must have been one heck of a strong man. Are you taking like Mega Man vitamins or what? You know, how you got him bound up and put him on the altar there? Or was it just like Jesus that he willingly carried it? And they both knew, as Abraham confesses, we're going to go and worship, then we're going to come back to you. And as it says in the book of, of Hebrews, Abraham knew that he would raise his son from the dead. And so then, so Isaac willingly walked up there. Abraham didn't have to fight him. He put him up there on the altar. That's a conversation I want to love to have. But I'm not going to go up and I'm going to be searching. Hello, where's Abraham here? <laughs> Anybody here by the name of Abraham? You know, and then, oh, that's me. I got my name tag here. Who are you? And then we sit here and we have, no, no, I'm, you're going to know everybody. Because you're going to be like God. That, that, that just, that's just kind of mind-blowing. Because we'll be at one mind. Right. Yes. His will and his mind. And maybe that's where you're going with that, Tom. Our mind will be like his and our will will be like it. It's not that we're only going to know Jesus. We're going to know everybody. Just like Jesus knows everybody. And knows us all by name. It was described to me as if you went to something very, very special. It, which you will be. And, 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 and you were there. You knew everybody who was there, but you weren't thinking about it. That, that's correct. Now, that I will go with. Everybody says, I want to go to heaven because I want to see Grandpa George again. And I understand what you're saying. But I want to go to heaven, not because I want to see my Grandpa Fred Allmeyer, which I really want to do. I want to go to heaven because I want to see Jesus. And that's, and that, because what makes Jesus, Jesus, or what makes heaven, heaven, is that Jesus is there. Not that Fred and Flora Allmeyer are there. And, yeah, I'd like to see my grandma and grandpa again. But what makes heaven, heaven is seeing Jesus. And that, and maybe that's where, and, and for right, from that perspective, Tom, you're, you're exactly right on target. Our eyes are going to be focused, especially when it's time for worship, which is all the time. Always, because remember, everybody's around in a circle, and every eye is looking where? <laughs> to the Lamb who's on the throne. To the Lamb who's on the throne. And from that standpoint, Tom, you're, you're, you're spot on. You're spot on. Yeah. But, so like, go ahead. Children of miscarriages. Will they? Will, they'll be there. Absolutely. Because and, and, <coughs> Heather and I have had several. So I always, I always want to say I'm not, I'm not really the uh, mom and dad of... Uh, of five kids, I'm, 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 you know, I'm parents of eight, and so we'll see those three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll know them, and you'll know them. Yeah. Mhm. Mm Pretty cool. No, it is very cool. It's very cool. That 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 adds a whole new perspective to things. That is, that is a whole new perspective to things, and uh, especially you know from this. But then we get into how old they're going to be, and uh, they're they're you know they're. We're into the hidden things, you know, of God. But will, will I see them? Will I know them? Absolutely. And you know, that's that's kind of a, that's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, I got five kids here right now, but really, I got eight kids. And so now you finally get that chance. That's why you know we kind of did a little service for them. And uh, you know, you kind of need that because this isn't the end of the line. No, they weren't baptized, but they did hear the word. And God created faith in him. Just as David said, even when I was in my mother's womb, you made me trust in you. Yeah, in the Psalms. And that's and that's something to remember. This is good. We're kind of we're not getting everything, but we're but these are these are great questions. Yeah, and then we'll get to Mel. But it's go ahead, Cindy. also to say that the person who has a miscarriage does not go to church where the child is not is not healed. 
I can't make a judgment. If again, it's the word. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If if if, if we can't sit here and say you know all miscarriages go to heaven, right. I you know but individual things that I'm gonna leave that to God. <laughs> but if they're not hearing the word, I don't I, I don't have a lot of comfort there. Because I know my one professor even talked about the fact that in the movie you've got the fluid, so the water's there too. Yeah. So, you know, but there, the, 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 that's that whole thing of God, because God always works with creation with water, which is what we'll get to here. Now it'll be next week. But, you know, kind of this whole thing with, 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 with the recreation, what children are uh, aborted. Um, there again, only faith comes by hearing. I've heard, I've heard people say every aborted child goes to heaven. Well, if that's the case, we might as well just kill every child in the world. Because then, when then I can be assured that everybody makes it. We can't, you know. No, again, the only way is faith, and I don't have the visible proof of faith there. They're not baptized. Everything else, I leave that to God. I leave that to God. But I can't make this blanket statement like I've heard a lot of Christians say: every aborted child goes to heaven. That's not a biblical statement. Yeah, so you've got that too. There's a lot of things that fall into that, yeah. But there, there we have to kind of leave that into the, in the hands of God. We're saved. How to get it? The main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. How do you make it? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. If And God can create faith in the womb. If they've heard, God creates that trust because of the Psalms. David, even when I was in my mother's womb, you made me trust in you. If God does that, they're saved. But that's, that's the, I can't get specifics now. Person A, person B, person C in the womb. I, I can't go there. That's the hidden thing of God. I can only take it so far and leave it there. Yeah. Well, see, because so many things happen in today's world that we've thought of in biblical days. Except for abortion in John's day, very much alive. They had uh, abortificants. They get the magic potions. Paul talks about them all the time in the Greek. Pharmakia. That was an evil word for the early Christians. Where we get pharmacy today. Pharmakia was the pills that caused women to abort their children. Those who practice. We don't get it in the English. You get it in the Greek. Those who practice pharmakia. And, and then you had the practice of infanticide. Where a girl is born, don't want it, want a male, go and put it in the garbage dump. Who went and rescued them? Those dastardly Christians. We go and rescue them and save them. And that's one of the reasons, too, why the Romans hated the Christians. Because they went and saved the kids in the, in the, in the garbage dump. So, s- some of these evil things have always been around. Now, some of these gene splicing, cloning, yeah, that wasn't around in, in, in Paul's day, or in John's day, but... Some of the homosexuality, everything else, that, that was that was all. Oh right. yeah, I knew that. Yeah, all I that just stuff. Didn't know about it. Yeah, no. It, again, because you see it in the Greek, but you don't see it in the English. Huh. So what's it called in the English then? Those. Uh, what are they? Uh, sometimes it's translated those who practice what sorcery. Okay. Isn't that what they? Oh, yeah. I, I think I think that. I think that's because it's kind of the scene with the magic potions. Because it was seen as kind of magic. So those who practice sorcery and some other things, I think it's how you get that. I have to go back and look. And all other sorts of things they thought. Yeah, yeah. So that would have to be thought witchcraft, you know, yeah, yeah. gods. I would never have thought. Yeah, that but see, that's where, but see, it's where you kind of get some of that stuff. It's in the list of the catalog of sins that Paul trots out periodically. And that's yeah. a- I have to go back and look at specifically what... How that's translated, but yeah, let's let's end with this in the remaining 90 seconds um, that we have here. This is where we struggle, and we'll end here with with verse seven. And I heard the altar saying, "Yes, the Lord God Almighty, true and just, are your judgments." That that's where we struggle. This is the God who sends people eternally into hell, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But think of all the parables that Jesus told. You know, then we'll be sent into hell, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, grinding their molars in outer darkness. All these visuals. Jesus tells us this. 
And so what? Jesus was a liar there? But the interesting thing is people want to say, well, it's not fair, it's not just, but where, where does love and justice meet? And it meets at the center of the cross. We've got John 3.16. God loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in it should not perish, but have eternal life. God loves the world so much, what does he do? He sends down his son. What does he send his son down to do? To die, to meet the justice of God. To pay for the sins of the world. Sins have to be paid for God's not a Big Ten ref that just, hey, we'll just let them play today. They'll beat each other up. As long as they don't have a broken arm and they're laying on the floor, all right, in the Purdue-Michigan State game, just let them keep playing, man. Just let them play. They still got two eyes and two arms. Let them keep going. All right, let's just bang each other up. No, God says, wait, wait, that, that's, that's a foul. He actually blows the, the, the whistle. Go to some of these. I went to the Argus game. Was it last week? My goodness gracious, I think the officials ate their uh, whistles. They never blew them there for a while. Everybody was just, guys being thrown down on the ground. Dylan Kidding just got like, a guy did a taekwondo move over him, over the back and threw him down and then landed on him like it was WWF wrestling. Pat, you love this. And then just <laughs> sitting there and laying on top of him. And I was ready for the official to get that one, two, three, he was pinned. And then finally, you know, the guy rolled over. Back down the, the court, and Dylan's just sitting there, right down. The guy just body slammed me. You know, he just everybody was laughing because he's just like, "How can you blow the whistle?" You know, I mean, it's just, it's just kind of. But you know, God actually gets the whistle out, and what does He do? He blows the thing and says, "That's it. That's a foul. That's it. That's a foul. You actually sin, and it's got to be punished." But instead of punishing the guy from Lakeland, who actually was a real little guy, Cameron Shepard, which I can't believe, how he got him on Dylan's like a foot taller and got him on his back and rolled him over and pinned him down. I'll never know. But, you know, he actually blows the uh, whistle and says, Cameron, that's a, that's a, that's a foul. That's a, that's a foul. You, you, you foul. You all sin. You all deserve, as we just heard. Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. We all deserve that. So how is any of us going to be saved? Through the blood of Christ. God places, as I said in the sermon today, when he's baptized, all he becomes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lord has laid upon him, the prophet Isaiah, the iniquity of us all. It's paid for here. This is where the love and justice of God meet. And your sins are paid for. If you have that and you're clothed in the white robe of Christ's righteousness, your sins are paid for. You don't have to pay for them. You get to go to heaven. But if you don't have that, as we'll see the rest of the plagues next week, all these things happen. Look at the end of verse 9. And we'll close with that. They did not repent and give him glory. Look at the end of verse 11. They did not repent of their deeds. They didn't repent, so they now they stand there clothed in their own sin, and they'll face the judgment of God. And true and just are His judgments. The wages of sin is death. It's what, as we close, the crook on the cross says, we're getting what we deserve. But see, here's the thing, because of God's mercy, you don't have to get what you deserve. But if you don't want that, and you want to go it on your own, you'll get what you deserve. And God will be fair with you. Everybody says, well, that's not fair. Well, if you want fairness from God, you'll play the fairness game. The question is, you don't want fair. What do you want? You want mercy. You want grace. You don't get what you deserve, and you do get what you don't deserve. There's, there's what you want. So you, you, you are not asking for fairness. You're looking for mercy and you're looking for grace. And in Jesus, you have it. And the purpose is, is to get people to turn away from themselves and their sins while there's still time, as we'll talk about next week. Because there's time in between these. There's time right now, as God still judges in time and history. But there's coming a time, as we had that chart on the board here, the kind of the timeline, when there will be no more time, and that's it. So repent while you still have.
and we'll close out 16 next week and then jump into 17. So let's go ahead and we'll close with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the blessings that in this life you work through the law and the gospel to bring us to repentance and to give us the ability to have faith and trust in you and to be covered in your righteousness as our sins are cleansed and forgiven. We pray, O Lord, that we would continue to repent and believe the gospel and that people here on earth would hear that good news, that they too would repent, turn from sin and self, and to fear, love, and trust in you above all things. Bless us, O Lord, and be with us. For into your hands we commend ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, just a teaser here, as I did at the end of first service. We didn't get there. But at the end of verse 16, we'll get to Armageddon next week. And there's there's a big one. And that's going to be an eye-opener. Just like this was a wowser moment, Armageddon's going to be a wowser moment too because I'm just going to give you a teaser. It's a real dud.